Hello and welcome. Well, during winter, it is commonplace that parents are concerned about the health and well-being of their children due to the spread of colds, flus and viruses. 2020, however, has presented an exceptional set of circumstances collectively for everyone as COVID-19 has created an exceptional amount of heightened worries and concerns. So the question is, do you know what the difference is between the common cold and COVID-19? And if your answer is no, then tune in. This interview is definitely for you. To help explain this to us today, we welcome our special guest, Dr. Nalu, a paediatric doctor with over 10 years experience. Now, Dr. Nalu is here today to create awareness and to explain the difference between the common cold and COVID, something we all really need to know and understand, and also to provide education around common questions you may have, and to provide a credible relatable and accessible source of information to the public on this critical topic. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome. How are you? Very good. Thanks for having me. This is wonderful. And as we were just saying, this is something this time of year, more so than ever, um, that we really need to understand the difference between this. Um, and it's been said before um, that you have uh, a love for educating parents and, and patients about common health concerns. Um, but COVID-19 is just a little more than just the common health concern as we have sort of found out in recent months. So um, I'd love to understand from your perspective, what are the common concerns that you have found families are having like, during this time? Yeah, look, this has been a really unprecedented time for everyone. And it's, I guess it's probably like nothing any of us have been through in our lifetime. So it's quite an interesting time for the general public, for doctors, for parents, for everyone. Um, look, there's a lot of concerns. And I think a lot of the concerns come from what we're seeing overseas as well. And I think it's important to remember that what we're going through in Australia is quite different. Um, our rate of transmission and rate of deaths is much, much lower than overseas. Um, and although things are ramping up in Victoria at the moment, we're still, we're really in a very lucky state to be in, to be in Australia. Yes. Um, Agreed. Um, so yeah, yes, yeah, so I think a lot of the concerns are coming from that and the numbers that we're seeing overseas. Um, parents are worried about, you know, what if my child gets COVID-19? What does it look like if they have it? What are the effects if they get it, um, et cetera. So there's a lot, a lot of concerns out there and I'm happy to go through some of them. Okay, wonderful. Now to start with, we published your article and the title is Understanding the Difference Between the Common Cold and COVID-19 in Parents and Children. Now for someone who hasn't read the article yet, can you please give us an overview of what it's about and just tell us what inspired you to write it? Yeah, well, I was approached by Kittypedia to, to write something on this topic because obviously it's something that's very important and relevant at the moment. So I'm really glad that I had a chance to do that. And um, the article really goes into what is a common cold and what is the coronavirus. And really the, the tricky thing that is that there isn't much of a difference, which is what's making this all very confusing at the moment. Um, and I also discuss what the treatments are in that it's generally supportive, um, which means that there isn't really much in the way of treatment, which is the same with all viruses, and what sort of um, groups of children are more susceptible, um, and also what parents can do to help reduce the spread as best they can at home and to also just bring up these questions with the kids and use it as an educational opportunity as well. Wonderful. And you've mentioned in the article that um, coronavirus is the name for a family of viruses um, and some coronavirus strains we have known about for years and are harmless. However, COVID-19 is the new circulating strain that can cause serious disease in humans. So initially, what is the difference between coronavirus and other common viruses? Yeah, so look, there are hundreds and thousands of viruses that circulate um, and every year, particularly in winter, we see children with any number of those viruses, which I, I say is harmless, but I mean, any illness can be harmful in any capacity in, in anyone really. But what we see come through emergency doors is generally what we call a common cold, which can be anything from a sore throat, red ears, headache, body aches, vomiting, diarrhea, could all these viruses can cause any host of those symptoms. Um, and there's about 10 or so that we test for routinely, um, not in every child with the virus, but in specific 
groups of children. And then apart from that, there are hundreds and hundreds more that we rarely test for. It, we don't really need to know exactly what it is because we know the way that these, these common viruses behave. Coronaviruses are a family of viruses and there are some that we've known about for years that, are, that do cause fairly benign cough, cold, runny nose, fever illnesses. Um, and we know that sometimes children who are the really young, so really young babies, children who have other medical problems or who are on immune suppression medication, for example, can get quite sick with these viruses. But the vast majority of children are pretty well enough to be at home with fluids and pain relief and they can manage the virus at home. Mm -hmm. Coronavirus, as far as we've seen, in the, the current COVID-19 SARS virus that we're seeing circulating is generally more mild in children. So it does cause a bit of a common cold type picture. Um, I keep saying, doing that in inverted commas because there isn't really a common cold virus per se. Um, so the, coronavirus, the, the current COVID-19 does cause this very similar picture in children. The tricky thing with that is it does also, can also cause other side effects that we're seeing mostly overseas. We haven't seen that here because we're not getting the same numbers as we are overseas. Mm -hmm. And this current one is causing a lot of severe illness and death, unfortunately, in the older population. Mm -hmm. So although it, it is a bit like a, a usual virus, there's that other imp um, complications that we're seeing. Yes. And there are still um, a lot of un un unanswered questions, um, which is the biggest challenge for everyone at the moment. Um, and with regards to children, I've read that the Mayo Clinic in the US has reported that although rare, um, infants under the age of one um, are at higher risk of severe illness from COVID-19, um, which as you mentioned before, doesn't necessarily relate to school age children. Um, but studies have also showed that newborns um, may be infected with the virus during childbirth or exposure to sick caregivers after delivery. Not so much here in Australia, as you've just alluded to, this is more so overseas, but it's just important for us to be aware of what is happening overseas uh, here in Australia. Um, and also older children who get the virus um, have symptoms that don't, uh, that, that tend to be mild and cold like. Um, and they sort of can recover within a week. So it is broad, it, it, depending on the age of the child and obviously on, on the strain. So I just wanted to ask in general, what are your yeah. thoughts on this? Yeah, I think that's what's making this so confusing. You can have yes. zero symptoms and be positive or you can be really sick with it. So, and I think that's what's really confusing for parents and for health professionals as well. Mm -hmm. um, suddenly we've gone from a winter where every snuffle is just put down to a, a simple virus, but now we need to think of every single snuffle as potentially being COVID. That's um, it. Not necessarily, <laughs> yeah. not necessarily because the child will be super unwell, because we know that children in general have more of a mild illness, but we do know that the spread of it to old, the older population or um, those with other medical problems, it can make them really quite sick. And yes. we're just seeing more and more evidence of that coming up so mm -hmm. it's yeah it's it's really hard to distinguish the difference between a coronavirus COVID-19 illness and a, a regular virus. Yes and you, you've mentioned earlier in this chat that there's no common cold per se that there are hundreds of viruses that can cause a whole host of different uh, different symptoms um, from cough, red, th uh, red throat, runny nose, sore ears, vomiting, diarrhea, rash, and many other symptoms. So I'd love to know um, what COVID symptoms should parents look out for that would present differently than a common cold, flu, or virus then? Well, that's the tricky thing. There isn't, they all overlap. So the, the most common symptoms of COVID-19 are runny nose, cough, sore throat. Um, and then there's also fatigue as well in there. But honestly, so many viruses can give you those symptoms. So I think at the moment, we have to, just for the public health safety, we have to assume that any of those symptoms are COVID-19 until proven otherwise. Mm -hmm. So for many parents with, the, with younger children, um, they have a runny nose, coughs, um, all of these things are constant um, throughout winter, as you've just mentioned. But if it's yeah. a new cough or a new fever or a new sore throat, um, that they should maybe consider getting the child tested. Is that right? Absolutely. I would say at this stage, just given particularly if you're in Victoria, um, Given the, the situation at the moment, any cough, runny nose, 
um, sore throat, difficulty breathing, all of that should be tested really for COVID, more for the, for the child's sake, but also for public health safety as well. Mm-hmm. So this is particularly important for those living in places where community transmission is occurring, as you've mentioned, um, such as Victoria, um, and we've seen some numbers increasing in New South Wales recently too. Um, but some children, particularly through winter, um, have an ongoing sniffle or cough, um, yep. <laughs> and um, one infection can really roll into the next two. So in this, situ- in this situation then, is it... Um, one thing to watch out for worsening of fever and cough as well. This is another thing that parents Uh, should be sort of taking note of. Yeah, absolutely. Look, like you said, it's not uncommon for a child to have a snotty nose for 50 weeks of the year. We see that a lot, especially with children in childcare. Um, But like you said, anything new, absolutely any new respiratory type symptoms, so anything sort of head, throat, chest, um, I'd get that checked and consider that it could be COVID-19 until you've got a negative test. And definitely if the symptoms are are becoming worse, maybe don't hesitate to get tested then, would you say? Yeah, absolutely. And I guess the other thing to remember is that just like with COVID-19 or with any illness, if a parent is worried about their child, they should always seek medical medical support. I, I don't think this situation should scare parents from going to emergency departments and going to see doctors because regardless of COVID-19 or anything, if you're worried about your child, they need to be looked at. Yes. So just to reiterate, the symptoms of COVID-19 include fever, cough, runny nose, sore throat, difficulty breathing and fatigue. Um, Symptoms obviously more so in in adults. Um, And in that instance, that may also include nausea and diarrhea and confusingly um for some people there may be no symptoms at all so and even more confusing (laughs) um the hundreds of harmless everyday viruses that can cause all of these symptoms too is is a crossover and this is where many people are becoming confused is is that right yeah agree agree and it's, it's hard for parents it's really hard for health professionals but i think the safest thing at the moment like i've said before is to just assume it's COVID 19 until we know it's not Mm -hmm. And children's temperature can rise above 37.5 degrees for a multitude of different reasons. How do parents know when they should seek um, medical advice from a practitioner with regards to the um, increase of temperature um, rising in children? Yeah, look, that's a really good question because that's something that brings kids into emergency a lot. Um, So we call a fever anything above 38. So... um, And you have to be a bit careful how you measure it as well. A lot of the forehead thermometers uh, can be up to a degree off. Um, So underarm or in the mouth is probably better. But yes, so temperature over 38 is what we'd call a fever. Ordinarily, I would say that a fever in itself, in a well child, doesn't necessarily need to be looked at unless there are other concerning features. Mm -hmm. Um, But at the moment with the COVID situation, I'd say any child with a fever should... And especially if they've got respiratory symptoms, should have a, um, a COVID swab done. Um, so I'd say any temperature above 38, particularly with the snotty nose, cough, sore throat, or difficulty breathing, um, should always be looked at. Alternatively, any child who doesn't have a fever and a parent's worried about should also be looked at. So I think it's important to not get hung up just on the number of the fever itself. A child with a temperature of 40 can have quite a simple viral tonsillitis and be okay enough to be managed at home or a child with a temperature of 37 can be really sick so I would I would never take a fever by itself to mean a child is really unwell or not it's always in combination of other symptoms how are they looking how are they eating and drinking are they making wet nappies passing urine it's sort of in combination with everything Um, and we see a lot of families who come to emergency with a high fever and a really well happy child that we're not as concerned about. And we see children who look really sick who don't have a fever at all. So it's really up to the parents' gut instinct on whether there's something else going on apart from just the number of the fever, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yes, absolutely. Um, In general, is COVID dangerous in children then? Look, what we're seeing is generally no. Um, It's more the older population who get the really severe COVID-19 disease, but 
like I said, with the numbers overseas, we are definitely seeing children who do become quite sick with it um, and have some <laughs> other complications. We haven't quite seen it to that extent here, just purely because our numbers of infection in this age group is much, much lower than overseas. Um, so in general, I'd say COVID-19 is much more mild in children. They can have anything from no symptoms to mild respiratory symptoms. We're not seeing the severe disease as much, um, but it is something that all pediatric doctors and pediatric hospitals, emergency centres are preparing for, just in case that does happen. Um, the, the healthcare workforce is, is definitely preparing for children who potentially become unwell. And with regards to transmitting um, the, the virus also, I've read that children transmit the virus the same way that adults do, which is through droplets when they sneeze uh, or if they touch a surface um, and then touch their face. And especially in, in younger children, we don't know, we all know that they don't like to wash their hands um, and that they like to be close to one another as well. So in a similar fashion, these droplets may be transmitted from one child to another. So I just wanted to know your thoughts on that in particular. Yeah, look, I mean, anyone who's got kids knows that it's impossible to get their, to keep their <laughs> hands to themselves and to not slobber on things and not touch things after they've slobbered on the, their hands. Um, so transmission theoretically is really tricky in children. We haven't seen as much being transmitted from child to child as you would expect. And I think that's probably because of a lot of the isolation and social distancing that we've um, started quite early on here, which is why I think Australia has done really well. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, it's really hard to, to do the social distancing with children, particularly when they don't understand. When a child is old enough to say, wash your hands before you eat, that's one thing. But if they don't understand that, it's really tricky, which is why I think the social distancing, limiting public outings, you know, limiting visitors, um, obviously following the local um, recommendations is really important because with children, unless unless the parents force them to not go into those situations, there's no way that you can stop them from touching things. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why that's where the social distancing really is important for children. Great advice. And in, in your view, I'd love to know the answer to this question. Can viruses in general be treated and co can COVID be treated? Yeah. So look, viruses, the vast majority of viruses cannot be treated. Um, so antibiotics work to kill bacterial infections. Um, we do have some antivirals for some viruses, but most of them can't. So most treatment for, that we do for viruses is what we call supportive. So if a child is dehydrated, we'd give them fluids. Uh, if they need some oxygen support, we'd give oxygen. But that's not really to treat the virus per se, it's to treat the, the <coughs> side effects or the complications of the virus. COVID is much the same. So there's no antiviral to treat COVID. So if, if a child gets COVID and needs hospitalization, it'd be similar sort of um, fluids or oxygen or breathing support. Um, there are some medications that they're trialing here and there for more severe disease, uh, but there's no treatment as such, which again is what's making this really difficult. Mm -hmm. So all in all, parents really just to be able to prevent um, their children or anyone in the family from getting COVID is to adhere to social distancing. Um, as we know with young children, this is not easy. Um, so parents should really be following isolation rules, have children avoiding touching objects in public places, washing hands um, often and always before meals um, and keeping um, commonly used areas around the home frequently cleaned, would you say? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, look, with childcare and schools and things, it's, it is a bit trickier. Uh, and at some point, you have to, it's up to the parents really to decide if they'd rather keep the child home or send them to childcare. Of course, it's hard to keep children home all the time in terms of work and lifestyle and things like that. So it's just really finding that balance. Um, and yeah. you know, if you can keep the children home, that would be recommended. But otherwise, of course, children do need to go to childcare, parents need to be able to get to work. So I completely understand that. Um, and it's important just to question the child cares as well, just to make sure that they're trying to follow, um, you know, they can't really distance as much in child cares, but just being really careful with hygiene and hand hygiene. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's okay to ask those questions. 
Yeah, um, I'll, I'll maybe expand on that in a little bit in just a moment. But I just wanted to ask initially, are there any other things that we can be doing to help, I guess, our general health? Um, I've spoken to um, a lot of people um, in, in the last um, few months now, um, and a lot of them have mentioned about a balanced diet, um, keeping on top of, um, you know, background medical, underlying medical problems, ensuring that um, we have, you know, vaccines for children up to date and being aware of immune boosting fads per se, but is there anything else besides this in particular that we, we really can be doing and or just all of those things that we've just mentioned? Yeah, look, that, that's a really good list. Um, you know, there are a lot of fads out there at the moment and a lot of people are jumping on the immune boosting bandwagon. I think really the main thing is keeping up a balanced diet, uh, making sure that, that um, you know, with a balanced diet, generally you have enough of the vitamins and min minerals that you need for a healthy functioning immune system um, or supplementing vitamins and minerals if the child doesn't have a balanced diet for whatever reason. I think it's really important to keep on top of the background medical problems. I worry that at this stage with a lot of telehealth and you know reduced contact with medical professionals that children with background medical problems probably aren't being followed up as closely as they would have otherwise mm -hmm. so i think it's really important for parents to keep up you know diabetes medications or even keeping up their immune suppression medications for various diseases keeping up that medication and keeping up the health professional contact to stay on top of those background medical problems because not just for covid-19 but for any any um, infection that comes up, you know, any child with background problems tends to be a bit, have a bit less reserve. So I think it's really important to keep on top of that. And adults as well, um, I might add. I know we're chatting about kids, but really important for adults to keep on top of all of their background medical problems around now as well. And um, sure. Yeah, continue. Yep. <laughs> no, no, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, and just ensuring, I guess, when, when children are out in public, just ensure that they're trying to avoid touch, touching their eyes, their nose and their mouth um, with giving that, I know that we're speaking about COVID, but with picking up any other bugs or anything else um, and teaching children how to cover their nose and mouth with the tissue and cough, coughing and sneezing and or into the elbow and obviously using hand sanitizer is obviously a really big thing. Would you, would you yeah, say? Yeah, they're huge general? things. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, I, I forgot to mention that before, but absolutely. Hand hygiene in general is so important, not just for COVID-19, but for any virus, really. Yeah. Um, and I'm really glad that we're actually, we're starting to think about this a bit more because you know, we might see less rates of other viruses as well with, if we keep in the future. Yeah. yeah. And I guess it's really commonplace that children can spread um, bugs and pick up all kinds of, you know, bugs and viruses whilst at preschool um, and at school in general, as you were just mentioning. So in your view, what parents... Um, what should parents be asking, I guess, kindergarten, preschool, childcare centres, and maybe even primary and secondary schools about how um, they are protecting their children? What sort of questions should, should they be asking? Yeah, look, I think it's important to be realistic. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's almost impossible to have a group of kids together and to, especially the younger they are to make sure they don't touch each other and touch things. Um, but I guess it's just checking that there's regular cleaning of surfaces if the children are old enough, making sure they're washing their hands before meal times, um, And it will be good to know whether there's just some general education about hand hygiene. There's a lot of really fun videos about hand washing and things like that. So it will be good to know that primary schools and child cares are trying to, to take on that education side of it as well, because it's a really important educational opportunity for children as well. As well. So, so schools and, and, and daycare and, and kindergarten preschool should have some strict protocols around frequent cleaning. They should um, be able to go over, over and above their, their standard regulations, would you say? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it'd be fair enough for parents to check that the childcare workers and the teachers and whatnot are, are also being protected and that they're also being responsible that if there's someone's unwell they won't come in that they'll do strict isolation of anyone who's been in contact and you want to make sure that there's clear communication between the parents <clears throat> and the child care and school if there are any concerns about anyone having COVID-19. Mm -hmm. 
And I just wanted to address the long-term biological effects of COVID-19 stress on children's future um, health and development. Um, there have been many external stresses coming out from this pandemic that have left a, a lasting imprint on children's health around the world, not necessarily here in Australia, but their children's well-being that can link to stress and chronic health conditions in the future. And this being um, different things, even like, for example, like parental stress, um, school closures, um, lower household income, uh, loss of co-curricular co activities. So I'd just love to know from your perspective, um, what advice do you have that can help parents support their children and adolescents just to thrive during this time with all these added things that they're adding, I guess, to, to you know, to, to stress and to the health and wellbeing of children? Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up because I think it's much, it's something that we don't talk about enough mm -hmm. um, with regard to COVID because there are, of course, all of the health implications, but what about all the non-medical related implications of being in lockdown, of all of this uncertainty around the world? Um, with, I'm sure that there's going to be increasing rates of mental health um, issues in teenagers and children after this and like you said the family stresses as well in low in, lower income in families family violence domestic violence and I'm, I'm sure these things are going to surface the longer this continues so i think it's really important for parents to just be aware of the non cough cold fever related side effects of covid that's currently going on and just really keep that dialogue open where you can especially with teenagers who might retreat a bit in this situation um, but also that sort of younger age group that aren't quite old enough to understand why we need to be in lockdown and, you know, those questions about why can't I go to a playground or why can't I do this and why can't I do that? Just really trying to acknowledge that it's a difficult time for them and try to use this as an educational opportunity for them as well. There are a lot of resources online for parents to help them deal with how to talk to children about COVID-19 um, and I can send through some links as well to that if that would be helpful. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important for parents to be aware that while it is very stressful for them to think about work and family and isolation and social distancing and whatnot, it is equally stressful for the children. And I think it's important to acknowledge that and just really talk about it. Yes, and we've published and a few. Seek help sorry. Early. Oh, sorry. No, they continue, <laughs> what were you saying? Um, just, just seek help early. I know that you know, medical and psychological support is looking a bit different at the moment because of COVID-19, but I think it's important to still make sure that you're accessing, whether it's through telehealth or Zoom psychological sessions or whatever it is, just to make sure that you're still seeking support. Um, and for parents with themselves as well, if they're struggling with the partners or, uh, you know, just seeking family, family supports as well where possible. Mm -hmm. and, and here at Kittypedia, we've published um, over 100 articles well and truly easily now um, with regards to supporting families through COVID, but in particular, right. there's been quite a few that have addressed um, the psychological side um, of, of COVID and also how to speak to children about COVID. And equally, as you said, oh, any, any other links that you've got would be just wonderful as well. So we can put them in the show notes. Um, but lastly, I've left the, I guess, the really serious and he heavy question to last, um, which you you've alluded to some of this stuff happening overseas um, but there have been a lot of medical papers in the last few weeks highlighting multiple areas of the body aside from the respiratory system that can suffer long-term damage as a result of contracting COVID um, and whilst I guess the uh, coronavirus disease that has caused COVID-19 presents much milder symptoms um, most in the in most children under the age of 18 um experts have warned that influence infants sorry are more uh, susceptible to COVID-19 um I guess a, a sort of a more sus susceptible to it due to their um less uh, developed immune systems um and many parents have expressed concerns about the multi-system um implement I hate to say the word inflammatory <laughs> syndrome in children as a side effect that coronavirus can appear um, three to four weeks after a child has con contracted the virus. Um, so this particular uh, syndrome, which is also known as MISC, M-I-S-C, can, uh, can cause different parts of the body to become inflamed. I just wanted to ask um, just initially what's been... Um, your exposure and, and or un understanding of, of this more so in children overseas at the moment 
Yeah, look, the, the research is still being conducted and still being gathered. So I, I think the tricky thing is we don't really know for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and the virus is behaving so differently in so many different people uh, that it's really hard to get a clear pattern of it. But um, I think there is emerging evidence of multi-organ involvement. Um, and that's through the blood vessels mostly. And we're seeing blood, you know, blood vessels are everywhere in the body. So although it presents primarily as a respiratory illness, I think there's mounting evidence that it can involve other body parts and other organs. Um, we're not seeing as much of it here, again, as I've mentioned, just because of our, our numbers are so much lower. So we will be guided by the experience overseas. Um, I think it's trick. My exposure has been very little because I've actually been on maternity leave since all of this um, <laughs> started. So I haven't actually seen that many children with um, with multi organ involvement at all. Um, but I think it's important for parents to just be aware of it. Um, I wouldn't be, you know, I would I would just take on the same level degree of concern about their child. Um, in terms of if they present with any sort of medical problem at all, just go by the normal means, speak to the GP, go to emergency if you're concerned. Of course, the health professionals will always have COVID-19 in the back of their mind. Um, and we're very lucky that testing is, we're very forthcoming with the testing here and, and children will be tested for it if there are any concerns whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there's cause to panic. Um, I think parents should be concerned enough to be vigilant, to listen to the state advice and to seek support. But I don't think that we need to panic about um, no. everything but, that pops but, up with being COVID. It's, just, it's good for us maybe just to be aware of it um, more so at the moment. Not but, to, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think, I think at the moment with the way that things are going, particularly in Victoria, almost anything that comes up, medically that you're worried about with the child you, you need to keep COVID in the back of our mind um so as long as we're just we're keeping that in the back of our mind but not not being too concerned about it to the point that we're we're not leaving the house or doing anything um sort of trying to find that balance of being concerned and being on the lookout without being too overly anxious about it that it'd be really nice if we can try and find that balance Yes. And, and just, just to, I guess, finish on what the, the Mayo Clinic um, and what all the different research is finding about that, that MISC um, syndrome, but the yeah. Mayo Clinic describes it as a serious co um, condition, which parts of the body, um, such as the heart, the blood vessels, the kidneys, the digestive system, the brain, the skin and the eye eyes become inflamed. So just all in yeah. all, I guess we shouldn't underestimate the seriousness of the COVID infection. As you just said, it's just more, it should be at the back of our minds, but pretty much it yeah. seems like that COVID is like a nose to toes disease that can affect all different things from a loss of smell all the way through our bodies to frostbite in our toes. Um, and the number yeah. of young people in ICU, um, definitely overseas, um, is, is on the rise. So I guess for many people, this re represents um, a long-term scarring and disability with breathing and general health. So we want to avoid anyone um, at all, obviously, getting this, but in particular, obviously, children as well. This is something that they may live with for their, for their entire lives, some of this scarring. Um, so the condition is rare, as we know. Know, um, um, in children, um, but um, some people have actually um, some uh, medical professionals, and a lot of the reports in some cases have been mistaken with a Kawasaki disease and toxic shock syndrome, and that's how it's presented in children. Have you read anything or heard anything like that before? Yeah, similar, similar. That there is there is evidence of this occurring. Um, Kawasaki disease is something that we've seen long before COVID nineteen, um, and it's a very similar sort of illness. But and I guess it's now if we see a child that we would have ordinarily thought had Kawasaki disease, of course we'd think about COVID. Um, but again, I think that's that's something that happens when when a child is unwell enough to be seen by a medical professional, then it's our role really to think about that. I think the parent's role is to just be on the lookout. If there's any symptoms, particularly respiratory, but anything else that they're worried about, just always seek the medical support that they would and just be really, really, really alert about it and just really um, vouch for your child as well and to make sure that you're seeking the support that you need. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the other thing to mention, you, you mentioned briefly before, is the vaccinations. Just keeping up the routine vaccinations because we know that flu, for example, influenza can cause really serious illness in children and we see much more flu-related ICU admissions than COVID-19. 
much, much more. So just keeping on top of those things as well uh, is really important at this stage because, you know, we have, we're yet to see a child with the bad flu and COVID together. So we don't want to know what that does to your body. So yes, um, and, and make sure the vaccine preventable conditions we're staying on top of. Yeah. And I guess to further conclude, we should not be underestimating the seriousness of COVID infection. Um, in, definitely in children and if your child is showing symptoms you might be tempted to think it's just a cough um, but most of the time it will be just a cough I guess but yeah. um, it's just for us to um, I guess <laughs> just to have that early de de detection um, and I, I guess applying other measures as you've mentioned before such as physical distancing staying home if unwell um, hand hygiene all of these things are absolutely critical for um, our response and keeping our, ourselves yeah. and our family safe now we've touched yeah, I, on oh, sorry yeah go go uh, I, I was just going to add I mean the other thing about it being just a cough in a child is that a child might have COVID-19 and get away with just a cough but if that child gives it to their elderly grandparent they could very much end up in ICU or worse um, so although a child could be reasonably well with COVID-19, it's really important to make sure that we're keeping them away from other, um, vulnerable populations, particularly the elderly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We've covered a lot of information in this chat today. If you were to summarize your key messages for any parent watching or listening, what would they be? Um, so I'd say be concerned enough to follow advice but not concerned enough to panic. That's probably my number one. Um, then also any viral symptoms, consider that it's COVID until proven otherwise. So make sure that the, the child gets tested and to follow the state rules um, very closely for social distancing and isolation. Um, and just you know, advocate for your child. You know your child the best. And if you're concerned about anything, whether it's COVID-19 related or not, you should always seek extra medical support. Wonderful. And if parents have got any other questions um, uh, for you and or want to reach out after they watch and or listen to this chat, whereabouts can they find you? Um, you can find me on um, Facebook, my Facebook page, <laughs> Dr. Nalu, um, or on Instagram, that's Dr. Underscore Nalu. I'm sure we'll give you all the links. Um, but yeah, I'm generally fairly responsive to um, questions. I do have a newborn at the moment, so I'm trying to do it in between all of that. But um, yeah, very happy to be contacted on social media. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time today and really look forward to, to the opportunity of having a chat in the not too distant future. Stay safe and uh, speak soon. See you later. Great. Thanks, Rachel. See you. All right. Bye.